for the live event side, technology has really opened up so many new doors. It makes it so much easier for a band to be more known globally or around the country in different areas versus in the old world, you had to take a band and you had to have a street team doing the flyers. How do you make sure that when you're messaging with the Honda brand in this space that you don't interrupt the fans' experience? I, I think the key is that you have to be authentic. Honda has a long history uh, in music. This will be the 13th year of the Honda Civic Tour. So that authenticity comes through, making sure that you have some value exchange with the um, fans, making sure that as a brand we're giving and not just taking. We spend a lot of time at our music activations at the festivals, making sure that we uh, listen to the fans and uh, cater to the fans, and that the fans come first. So that authenticity and fan focus are the, the real things for, for Hana. Uh, Lee, the, uh, you know, the rise of uh, these EDM festivals have you know, gathered a lot of headlines and buzz. Um, Sold a few tickets. Sold a few tickets. Um, Talk about the evolution of the space, where is it going, um, and do you see any interesting opportunities ahead of you? Um, I think just electronic music in general is growing. Um, I think you look at bands, there's there's a few more synths and electronics on stage, you go with the guitars and stuff. Um, I, I think obviously um, you hear it in urban radio, you, you hear it in pop, it, it's dominating, and I think it's not much different than like if you look back, like. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis were making the hits, right? But you didn't know that. It's the same thing as Zed, but now Zed's the star, right? Because it's Zed featuring these people, and it's sort of flipped, and, and these producers, um, many of them are, are really talented musicians. They're not just sitting on Fruity Loops and looping something together, and here's a song. I mean, you know, Zed starts songs on, on a piano, right? And then he takes it to a keyboard, and he loads it in, and um, he's an incredible drummer, and, and these guys, you know, arrange and compose. And they're going out and they're growing, and it's, it's the sound of now. The kids are responding to it. When I'm 33, so when I was like, you know, 18, the kids that were going to raves were, were, were fucked up. They had Jenkos on, gauge earrings, were doing ketamine in the bathroom, right? Like, I mean, this is, this is the subculture that it was. It was different. When you go to a, an EDM festival now, you know, the 4.0 uh, student captain of the football team is out there in his, you know, orange tank top and he's running around. And that's a huge shift in society. You know, like, that's what it is. It's here to stay. It, it is the mainstream. Um, you know, and, and it's the way that, that you make music. Like, I'm a purist. I have, my, my friend is guitar playing Grace Potter in the Nocturnals and he loves recording on analog, right? And it's amazing. And I have a ton of respect for that, but it's been done, right? What, what electronic stuff is doing is evolving the way that you make music and make sounds and can share things. Um, just as simple as, as sharing stems on a song and parts where somebody in Paris and somebody in Los Angeles can make a song together in two days, right? They don't have to sit in the studio or fly around. It's here to stay. It's growing. I mean, Perry's stage six years ago, if you look at that lineup, it was unreal. Like, Mastercraft, Justice, Boys Noise, Crookers, Dead Mouse, like, unreal. 3,000 kids there. You go there now at 4 p.m. in the afternoon and, and you know, see Foster Damas, there are 50,000 kids going ape shit, right? Like, you know, for my artists, I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm, you discuss them like a disclosure or Skrillex, it's like, do I wanna play the main stage or do I wanna play Perry? It's like, Perry's is pretty crazy and the kids are already there, I don't know if I wanna move them across the park, right? It's basically the third main stage at, at Lollapalooza, you know, so I think that's like I something. I predicted my, my partners, I said, in five years, it's going to be one one side of, of the uh, park is going to be electronic, then the other side is going to be the organic. Yeah. But but I want to say, you know, you know, we're all hot and heavy on the electronic. But I recently drove down to San Diego from Los Angeles, listening to John Lennon, uh, his uh, uh, anthology. Have you guys heard the the anthology, John Lennon anthology? And it's, it's, it's all fucked up things that he did, um, you know, like outtakes yep. with Bill Spector. Mm -hmm. And he's cursing at Bill Spector and he's telling him to shut up. And it really was great, man. <laughs> it was so good. He tried to get John Lennon to sing Be My Baby. And he sucked. I couldn't believe John Lennon actually sounded like shit. But he sounded so great at the same time. I was like, wow, 
he really can't sing. He must be fucked up right now. He must have been up for two days and trying to like appease Bill Spector. You know, I think what's gonna happen is it's gonna level out. Because there's gonna be times when we're not gonna wanna hear electronic sound. We're gonna wanna hear somebody who's kind of a little mad and a little madness, you know? So I think. I hope you got that shot. I hope you got that shot. I hope you got that shot. That's the shot of the public. Peter, you, you have a. I mean, that's what kind of, this is what you're still digesting, right? Still digesting, that's right? Still that, I need a sec. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> he could have said anything, and he was so good. He's so brilliant. <laughs> no, I, I know, so, so it's you can read the Nassau Long Island County phone book, and you're brilliant. <laughs> that's a tough actor fellow, but Peter, this is your the space that you, that you focus on. You know, sort of a, a maybe. Oh, makes it, um, you know, I would say this, like in Las Vegas on a tonight, Friday night, you know, the top 20 clubs, probably in Las Vegas, um, 20 out of 20, uh, well, at least we open, uh, uh, are doing e electronic music, EDM. So I saw that, and I think there's always a time when everyone's doing something, there's always an opportunity on the other side, mm -hmm. you know, a, a counter. So we just uh, opened a couple months ago uh, a venue at Brooklyn Bowl in Las Vegas, uh, that is really, although we've been proud to do Disclosure and Kygo and a lot of that, yep, yep. We, we, I have to say, we want to do a lot of live music. And that's why in our first months we booked Perry to do three nights, because there should be a room in the middle of Las Vegas that in addition to doing Tiesto and David Guetta and that stuff, should be doing live music. And it's, I, and so I, think, I think what Perry started with Lollapalooza, and it goes back to the curation of these odd mixes, they come together. I just think everybody in here is in this panel tonight is today is right. But what's happening is it's almost going back to 1965 when Marvin Gaye would be next to the Beatles on the radio. Um, everything became very formatted in the 70s and 80s. And Tom and I know it very well from the places where, where we've worked. And what we're seeing is is very much that kid, that 4.0 football captain standing there, ADM, who may be on his. Uh, you know, he's on his, uh, on whatever his device, he's on his, his iPhone, he's got, uh, he's got some P. Diddy on there, he's got some Jay-Z, he's got some U2, he's got some Skrillex, and that didn't happen 15 years ago. They were, I listen to rock, I listen to this. So what's happening is, and you're seeing, I have a 20-year-old college student who goes, who, the wears, iPod generation. Who, who does that, and his playlist is so eclectic, it blows my mind. So I think it's, I think it's a curation of these festivals. You go to Coachella, you go to Lollapalooza, you, you don't know what you're gonna see. And, and listen, we kind of borrowed that at our festival, where, where you, after you, is yeah, Jay-Z you and Kenny Chesney. So yeah. I believe that that's, that's what's happening. It's, it's not an either or now. I think we're back to good music rules. We, we, yeah. did this, we did this super jam at Bonnaroo, right? Two in the morning in the middle of a farm in Tennessee, okay? It was a three hour set. Skrillex helped put it together, right? With Mike from Incubus, Big Gigantic. Um, we had um, Robbie Krieger from The Doors, we had Mickey Hart, we had Janelle Monet, we had Lauren Hill, we had ASAP Ferg, we had Mystic Hill. Um, I'm, I'm scratching the surface of these people that came together and, and did this. Um, Damian Marley was part of it. It was it was unbelievable. And it was yeah. Skrillex was on guitar with Robbie Krieger while the lead singer of Cage the Elephant was singing Break On Through, and and Lauren Hill is is doing Fuji Records and you know Bob Marley covers out of Damian Marley's segment of it and and you know you're you're watching the guy from the Doors hang out with Ferg, right? Like that was fucking rad, right? And, uh, <laughs> And, and that I wouldn't happen that. unless there was an audience to drive that there, by tickets. There were hippies there, there were young kids, there were hip hop heads, there were kids that were there for dance music because Skrillex's name was associated with it. It was unbelievable. It was one of the most magical things I've been a part of and seen in music ever. You know, in my time, you know, it, was, it was pretty wild. You know, how everyone was there already. If you put that show up on sale, <laughs> it would be much harder. And we've talked about this, the different artists. What's tough is selling that show. What's great is at Bonnaroo, and it's kind of a responsibility for people, and that's why, who, who when you have a festival, you have 50,000 people or whatever, to introduce them to new things, to mixes. And hopefully guys like you, and you've done some of that at iHeart, when you do, you, you, they need to see that. Because they may not realize that, because if you just put that show on sale, it wouldn't sell as many tickets as just Skrillex. You know, sometimes when we try, but there's ways for people who are putting things on uh, um, to kind of to curate, 
you know, what, what people should see a bit. It's almost a responsibility a bit. You, you trust Lollapalooza. You go, yes. you go, you yes. buy the ticket before he announced the lineup. Yeah. But you know, we see that in the data as well. So, so that's, if I may compliment what you're saying from a pure analytical perspective, we, we, what we do, we scan the music library and we create a music DNA for each of our fans. And so you, you would see that it's quite amazing to see how diverse their music tastes are. 